Hey guys, and welcome back to a new video. In this video, I want to show you three mistakes you're potentially making with UI states on Android. And those aren't always and generally mistakes, but very often people don't take enough care about these things and then they can run into issues, which can really, really backfire in your app. And these mistakes are also very hard to find and to spot, at least if you don't know about them. So that is why we have this video. Let's uh, actually see this sample app. We have a little counter button. If we click this, then we update this. Uh, th that's also not an issue. If we rotate our device, then we can see um, that the state, the count is actually persisted across screen rotations since we keep the state properly in a view model. That will probably be familiar to most of you. What is also familiar to most of you is uh, that people like to have something like a UI state wrapper class. Um, so just a data class, which summarizes the whole UI state for a single screen. In this case, we have a counter, we have text. This text isn't actually being used in this example, but just that we have some kind of wrapper class. I added that. And then in our view model, if we want to increment that count, people just go ahead and say state.value is equal to state value copy. So we create a copy of the already existing state, but we only changed this single field, in this case, to the incremented count. And there is already problem number one. Not in this specific case, but you can very quickly run into an issue if you update your state like this. Because as soon as some kind of multi-threading is involved in your view model and in your state update logic, this approach can quickly cause race conditions. And it also happens very quickly that a view model has a multi-threaded environment because you just need to launch two different coroutines in view model scope that independently update the state. So what happens if we would have something like this? View model scope .launch, here we put in our state update and then we have another block that looks like this. So this would be thread one, or well, let's call it coroutine one to be 100% exact since it might be the same thread uh, and coroutine, coroutine two. And what might now happen is coroutine one actually reads the value of the actual current state and creates a copy of it. So here for this copy, the count might just be zero. Then our second launch block also started the work. It also reads the state where also the count is zero at this point. So here count is also zero. And what now happens if coroutine two finishes before coroutine one, which is something that can just happen in a multi-threaded environment. Then coroutine two will assign its changed copy with the incremented count to the state where the count is then being equal to one. So it assigns the, the same state, but with an incremented count here. And if then coroutine one finishes after coroutine two finished, what will happen is coroutine one will also update the count to one because it still created the copy before coroutine two finished its work. And since coroutine one also still thinks the count is zero, there is an issue. So instead of the count being equal to two, it's effectively being equal to one, even though two coroutines incremented that count. And in your normal day-to-day -day work, this is not often happening, but I have worked on very stateful apps uh, where state is frequently changing, also from within flow operators maybe, and that quickly causes race condition issues, which are very hard to spot if you aren't aware of how this works under the hood and how a state is updated. So what is the safest approach to fix this? No matter what kind of scenario you're in, you can always just use state.update because that is definitely a way to update your state without running into race conditions. So we can use the state update block. Here we get a reference to the state as it is. So this would be the current copy. And then we can use it.copy to create that new copy with the updated count. And this is now completely thread safe. So if we use the same down here, we will never run into the issue uh, that we actually update our state with um, the count being equal to one, even though we executed both these coroutines. So while the previous approach doesn't always lead to issues in any type of app, I would still recommend to just always stick to using update because it's not less performant or so. It will really just um, prevent that you run into race conditions accidentally. Okay, that was thing number one, which you need to be aware of. Thing number two is that still so many people don't think or don't know of process death on Android. So what is process death? 
Well, on Android, you need to know that Android devices are usually always trying to save device resources to optimize memory usage, to optimize battery usage. And that is why the operating system behind Android actually might kill your app if it is in the background and the device is hungry for memory. And when your app's process is killed, we call that process death. And that means that the whole application state will be killed as well. And yes, that even includes view model state. So view models can make your app or make your UI state survive uh, configuration changes, so screen rotations, toggling uh, dark mode, but it can, so it can actually survive a process death. And we can also easily try this out by going into our app, incrementing account a little bit, so we have that state nine saved right now if we now minimize the app. We still have it here in our recently used apps draw, but if we now go to a log cat, right click into a log cat and click kill process, that is how we simulate uh, process death. Then go back to our phone. You can see our app is still visible here. We could still go back to it. But if we do that now, our counter is actually reset. And depending on your screen, depending on your UI state, this can lead to very bad application states or just very annoyed users. So this is also a thing you don't always need to consider. But this is a thing definitely any Android developer needs to be aware of that this is a thing and that this could happen. And then you need to take a look at your code and decide if it's worth it to handle process death and to restore that state. Or if it doesn't matter in that screen, you also don't need to handle it. But you need to be aware that this thing exists. Since on the one hand, an issue could be a bad application state that state just doesn't get restored to the previous state and the user still gets to the previous screen. So that could lead to UI states that should never be possible. For example, that the user is not logged in anymore based on the UI state, but the user is still on a screen where they can only get to when they are logged in. Or well, this can just lead to some user frustration. Imagine you have like a, a huge form on a screen where the user enters a lot of data. And then just before submitting that, they leave the app and then come back a few minutes later, process that happened and they need to re-enter all these fields. So how can we fix this? We can fix this with something called saved state handle. That is basically just a bundle which you can use to save everything we want to restore after process death. So using this just allows us to save values we want to restore after process death. And we can also use this together with state flow. So in this case, we wouldn't need this mutable state flow anymore because we only work with saved state handle. And we can then say save state handle that get state flow. Here we can pass a key of the state we want to save and the initial value. So that is again just my UI state. But this state flow will now trigger whenever we change the value inside of saved state handle. And also updating works differently now because now we can't use update anymore since that's not a mutable state flow. Instead, we now need to update the value directly inside of saved state handle. So we need to say saved state handle dot state. So using the key state is equal to saved state handle dot get. We want to get the UI state of the state key. Now we can say dot copy, actually question mark copy. And here we then say counter is equal to actually state dot value dot counter plus one. And then we can remove this code. So this is now kind of equivalent, just that we update the value directly in saved state handle and not only locally in, uh, in the memory of our app. Of course, you could also write some kind of helper function uh, like the update function for mutable state flow. So you don't always need to um, type this line of code here, but the mechanism behind this is really the same. If we now relaunch the app, actually not yet, because um, we can only save uh, a class, a data class inside of saved state handle if that is a parcelable. So that needs to be something we can save in an Android bundle. We make that a parcelable, then we can use a very cool Gradle plugin called Parcelize, which will automatically convert that into a parcelable and um, define how the parcels are written. For that, we need to go to build that Gradle app and have our ID Kotlin Parcelize plugin. Just add that here in the plugins block, click sync, and then in here in our UI state, we can add this Kotlin personalized annotation and then our error is also gone. If we now relaunch the app, take a look here, then if we now update our counter a few times, you can see that still works, that survives screen rotations if I rotate the device, you can see counter stays the same. If we now minimize this, 
go to Logcat, right click kill process again, then we still see this app here. You can see the, the previous count was eight. And if everything works, if we properly restore the state, then it should still be eight if we now open the app and not zero any, uh, anymore. And yes, that is exactly what happens. So you can see we reopen this app and there our counter is eight and we can, we can work with that again. But of course, this is not necessary for every single type of state you have. That is why I really want to encourage you to still always think about whether it's worth restoring a piece of state from process death or not. But most people don't even think about that because they don't even know about that. And in that case, that is something I would definitely consider a mistake. And coming to the last mistake of this video about state management, which is really, I think, the worst one, that is if you have something like this. You have a session storage, just in a global singleton object where you store your session token for quick access. So something you might have is you have an app with a login screen. The user logs in, gets some kind of token from the API that grants access to this API with future requests. And then something people do is they just have this uh, global singleton here where they save the session token so they can easily access it in all their um, network requests also in a very fast way since this is of course stored in memory here. So in uh, the RAM of the app. But this is actually very dangerous because of process death again. Because it doesn't matter where in your app you have some kind of variable fields, if process death happens, they will be reset to the default, but the user still gets to the previously visited screen. So if this token is initially null and you temporarily set this to, I don't know, ABC here, imagine that would be your app's token, the user logs in, so the user gets the token, the user maybe uses some kind of social media app, the user visits some other profiles, and all that succeeds because the user has a valid token. But then if the user leaves at, let's say, another user's profile screen, and if then process death happens, but the user gets back to that profile screen, what will happen is this session token will be reset to null. Therefore, the user won't be able to make any more requests even though they are in the logged in section of the app. So this is really a mistake. Don't keep such state globally available in singletons or outside of singletons because in this scenario, there is no way to restore that from safe state handle. Safe state handle is always something that is tied to your nav backstack entry, so to the current navigation destination, so it's something related to the UI. And therefore, you can't restore something from safe state handle in objects that aren't directly tied to the UI. No, you can only do that in view models or in the UI itself. But since you need this session token globally across many screens, people put this in such a singleton and then it causes this issue. So how can you fix this? Safe state handle seems to be not the solution because we don't have access to that here. Well, then the only other thing that really works and survives process death is persistent storage. So what I recommend here is to save such session tokens directly in something like shared preferences or data store or even a room database because that is of course persistent and after process death, the app will simply reload that from preferences and everything will be as uh, the user left it. And again, it's not always an issue with these um, variable fields outside of a view model, but very often. So as soon as you have some kind of var that is not inside of a view model that represents some kind of state. And in the end, state is just a value that can change over time. And as soon as you have a var that is state, in all of these cases, you need to think about, okay, what would happen if this value would be reset on any type of screen? And if that would lead to an issue, then you know that you need some kind of logic to handle that, um, usually in form of saving that persistently or having some kind of reconnect mechanism, maybe if you lost some kind of connection or so. So definitely think of this. I hope these three mistakes and tips helped you to improve your state management logic on Android and in your Android apps. If so, then you will definitely also get a lot of more tips in my more advanced Android premium courses, which you can all find by clicking the first link down below. So if you want to get ready for the industry as an Android developer, nail your interviews, then you won't get around these courses. Other than that, thanks so much for watching this video. Have an amazing rest of your week. See you back in the next video. Bye bye.